Buenos días, buenas tardes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is a global event, a discussion, which is also a global discussion. Thank you for being with us. And we have a, a, some information to give you. Uh, it's called the wake-up call, bridging divides in South America. We are talking about Latin America. We have Mexico, Jorge Castañeda. We have also Laura Albornoz from Chile. We have Juan Bataleme from Argentina and Jason Masak from the US. He is an expert in Latin America. We're going to talk about an issue that not only touches on Latin America, it is rather a universal uh, theme, which is that of polarization. And that's the fact that resentment and anger seem to be taking over politics. It is a little bit like football when we see the rivalry in football. This seems to have arrived to politics in a rather aggressive manner. And uh, the pandemic has not helped at all with that, so quite the reverse. The expectations for improvement uh, uh, in the socio-economic uh, sphere in the region have not uh, been translated into any real measures due to the pandemic and its consequences, and also the whole range of political and social dilemmas that the pandemic has imposed. And we are going to see uh, very many election processes in this region from 2021 running up to 2024, except Bolivia, which has already had its elections, and Cuba, where there are no elections since, well, it has never had any elections really. The rest of the countries, uh, even Chile, are amidst uh, an electoral process. Argentina has just had its process and it will sh shortly see uh, another one. Mexico will go for election and almost all the countries in the region will. And we are witnessing a change in a wave. We've seen different waves. Uh, we saw a left uh, wing uh, wave and now we seem to be witnessing another sh shift uh, to the right but not in all cases as we will see so to talk about this we talk we will talk about laura uh, albornoz she is a lawyer she is a doctor in civil right by the university of seville and she has a masters of the international business school from madrid and between 2014 and 2018 she was the first lady to be appointed the director of the uh, uh, International Association for Copper. She was also a Minister of Women's Affairs between 2006 and 2009 in Chile. And I will now try to summarize her biography. She has a long curriculum. She was also the national vice president of the Christian Democratic Party in Chile, one of those parties that have played a leading role in these years uh, that we have seen and that uh, have uh, closed in Chile very recently. She is a senior fellow of the Atlantic House and she is currently an academic and researcher, leading researcher at the Faculty of Law at Chile University. We also have Juan Bataleme with us. He is a specialist in defense, digital politics, and external affairs from Argentina. He is an academic secretary of the Argentinian Institute for International Relationships. He is a director and he has a master's degree by the Buenos Aires University. He was the former director of the Defense, Mass, uh, Defense uh, for Argentina. He, uh, he has, in fact, a master's in public administration and uh, international relationships. And he was a, a student at Bradford University in the UK. And he won a Fulbright uh, 
sponsorship for University of Delaware in the US for the National Security and Defense Program. We have Jorge Castañeda from Mexico. He is a former minister of external relationships between 20, 2000 and 2004. He is a reputed politician, a politog, and he is also a writer. He has a specific interest not only in politics in Mexico, but rather across the Latin American region and his interest in relationships between Mexico and the US as well as Latin America. He got his degree at Princeton and the uh, University of Paris One. He got his master's from the Ecole Pratique des Autres Études in Paris, and he is a PhD by the University of Paris One. He's been teaching at the University of New York, where he's still working. He's published more than 15 books, and in April 2008, he was uh, selected as a honorary member of the US Academy of Arts and Sciences and also a member of the U.S. Philosophical Society. And we have with us, as I said, Mr. Jason Marsak. He is the director of the Center for Latin America of the Atlantic Council. He is based in Boston in the U.S. He has more than 20 years of experience in economics, in politics and regional development, working with high-level policymakers and private sector executives to shape uh, public policies. He supervised recently the development of a campaign centered around the reconstruction of democratic institutions in Venezuela. And he also shaped the efforts to draw a roadmap uh, for the post-COVID era. In, in this year, he also led an initiative uh, for uh, the Caribbean. Since 2016, Marsak is an adjunct professor at the George Washington's University's Elliott School of International Affairs. And before being part of the Atlantic Council in 2013, he was the co-founder of the America's Quarterly magazine. He won a Pulitzer Award. And uh, so I can say that we have a really highly qualified panel. And I would like to start with uh, Laura, who is there at the center of a great polarization process, something which is quite new in Chile. So Laura, I would like you to start by explaining what the dynamics was like that led Chile to this division. All societies have seen divisions, and Chile is no exception, of course, but this uh, has been something quite new to see a dispute between two different polls for the second round of the election, which will take place on the 19th. Laura, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the question. As we all know, Latin American democracies have arrived rather um, exhausted before the pandemic and today we can say that they are under siege. Chile is no exception indeed. Throughout history and even after the democratic recovery we have seen uh, certain democratic deficits in our country that uh, the citizens actually denounced. These are also structural deficits, which maybe the democratic regimes were not uh, able to cater for and to correct. And this led to the uprising of movements to demand uh, citizens' reforms. I'm talking about movements that were also part of the fight or the catalog of rights that uh, Democratic governments that established in Chile after the dictatorship promoted, uh, such as uh, uh, defense of human rights, uh, the rights of women, the rights of minorities, of migrants. So uh, today we see indeed a high polarization in our, in our country and we are 
uh, having a second round in the election process on the 19th, where there is an extreme right wing candidate who was a relevant uh, stakeholder. Um, the military government and on the other hand we have a, a young politician only 35 years of age who was part of the student movement in chile who started the mobilization process and who is uh, standing in alliance with the communist party although we are now seeing also ex concentration parties uh, to his candidacy um, this uh, fragmentation comes from the weakness, from the weakening of uh, the democratic structures that we are trying our best to correct through different mechanisms. And I believe that one of these, uh, and this is something that we will uh, discuss later, I'm sure, is about how to echo not only the structural deficits and the inequalities that there are uh, present in my country and in the region, but also including the new demands that came about on the part of the citizens who are uh, claiming for greater equality and these are needs and demands that were not met at the time or have been uh, forgotten or ignored altogether by the, politi by the politicians. Uh, this uh, is all for the time being. I think we can continue to analyze what these demands are, what uh, exactly the discourse of the new leadership is uh, in our country and which is associated to the needs of uh, the migrant communities, the feminist movement, the discourse about the need to protect the environment. Just a few days ago, a, uh, a nature and uh, environmentalist uh, a defender was uh, killed. And this is something that happens repeatedly in Latin America. We seem to be having problems with the connection of Laura. Laura, as you're trying to improve your connection, uh, by getting closer to your uh, Wi-Fi or using 4G, I'm going to move on to Jorge. Jorge, what Laura was describing does remind me of Mexico, because in Mexico there was a similar issue with regard to the management of the economy in the country. Uh, there was certain heterodoxy around all things economic and tax-related issues, and everything changed with the election of Mr. Andres Manuel López Obrador. And I would like you to describe uh, what the reality is like in Mexico after those years, uh, after Manuel López Obrador's mandate, and also looking ahead at the new elections. You are muted. Sorry, I apologize. I am very happy to be here and I'm really glad to greet you all. We are right uh, halfway through Mr. López Obrador's mandate. Y yesterday, there was uh, three years since he became president, and we can start to do a kind of balance of what his mandate was like and what the second half will be like with regard to what you said uh, about the consensus uh, in Mexico from uh, more or less uh, the early 1990s, I would say that partly López Obrador has kept that uh, equality. The orthodoxy in managing the public accounts, the public financing has been maintained over the years still beyond what many other countries in Latin America have done. Mexico is probably the uh, the country of the OECD and in Latin America with the least fiscal response or fiscal stimulus, less than one percentage point of the GDP as compared to 10 
7.5% in GDP of Chile, Brazil, or 78 in Colombia. López Obrador was even more orthodox in this regard than his predecessors, which he names neoliberals. This reflected in a really much smaller growth rate and a decrease, which is a lot larger than in the rest of the countries in Latin America. There was a slightly negative growth rate in 2019 with a construction of 8.5% in 2020. And then there was a, a peak in 2021 of around 5.5%. As we can see, this is the rate and the figures halfway through Lopez Obrador's mandate. And this is a lot less than what we've seen with the five or six preceding presidents who had a rather poor economic development of around 2.2% in GDP. But Lopez Obrador will finish his mandate, his six years mandate, uh, with a growth of around 0.8, 0.9 year on year over the course of his six years in power. So this is the first important point. The other important point is that we've seen a shift and this has already been a, 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 a real change that Lopez Obrador was able to push. And this is around social spending, not so much a quantitative change, the amount of money, because this is very similar to what was uh, being spent in the previous uh, mandate by Enrique Peña Nieto. However, this has reoriented uh, in part. Uh, the uh, health expenditure has been reduced. The expenditure for education has been maintained. However, social expending has uh, increased and it has gone to social programs in uh, direct uh, pledge of uh, sums of money for certain parts of the population. I'm referring to the elderly, uh, the disabled people, uh, minorities, uh, the unemployed youth, and some other uh, sectors of the society. This is what López Obrador calls uh, giving money to the poor is having very different results and the reduction in spending for education and health has also had very different results here and there but this is the change that i would say is the most important one lopez obrador was very cunning very uh, clever when it came to portraying his management as the management for great transformation. He refers to it as the fourth greatest transformation in the history of Mexico. But really today, we have seen half of his mandate and the transformations are either negative in what regards economic growth or they are not very positive really and they can't be argued when it comes to social programs because we've not seen the results in reducing poverty or reducing inequalities, or indeed when it comes to creating better welfare for people. That's very interesting. It reminds me a little bit of what happened in the first few years of Lula da Silva's presidency, which uh, used to talk about neoliberalism, and then we saw that uh, the changes were very different and things uh, uh, well, took longer. You, you were talking about three years, and here we had them in power for about 13 years. Now I'd like to move on to Juan. I think that the situation in Argentina is slightly different. It almost feels as if uh, Argentina Every four or eight years, uh, there's uh, a big change. We've moved from the Kirchners to then Mauricio Macri. Now we have Alberto Fernandez, who has lost the midterm elections in the Congress, if I'm not mistaken. 
And uh, I think that the Peronistas, the opposition, have had uh, more success in those elections. But I think uh, it'd be interesting to understand what the relationship is between the pandemic and these electoral results and how uh, you observe and consider the uh, political situation in Argentina at the moment. Hello to everyone and thank you to the Policy Center for inviting me to speak at uh, this event. In the case of Argentina, uh, the problems we have are long lasting. Uh, we've obviously inherited the problems that we had during the Kirchner administration and then Macri administration. But I would say that in Argentina, there is a draw between two different country models. The first one on one side is an integration or an alignment, an active alignment with the Western world. And then the other one is the, the issue that there is between uh, understanding what's happening in the Western world, as we can see now with the IMF, for example, and the relationship, which is very close with uh, some political regimes, which uh, can be a, a big opportunity or seen as an opportunity for Argentina, like uh, the relationship with uh, Russia or China. So this is the polarity we have. We are very far from 54% that the other candidates uh, obtained in elections in 2011, for example, and currently their political sphere is divided between what we'd call the, the front for everyone, which is about 30% of the population, about 40% of the population is looking for other options. I would say it's between 40-50% of the population look for a more center or right wing uh, option and this is seen through the success of some candidates. I think that the population is looking not just for transparency, they're looking to see who is responsible for someone who in um, the fact that in 1983 there was 4% poverty and now 43% poverty, and most of them are the youth. So um, this is uh, putting a very dire future for Argentina. So what happened with the pandemic? Basically, it just uh, showed something which is very common in Latin America. First of all, it just fragmented the situation, the, the population. And then the pandemic also um, had different voids in different areas and different regions of Argentina. That's why we've seen differences in the response to the pandemic within the country. And we can see it in the electoral, uh, in the elections that we recently had. People were they are very tired. Uh, for example, uh, they are the population believes that the lockdowns were a way of uh, abuse by the state on the population. And now we know that the opposition is starting to have a future. That's what we can see from the elections. But right after the elections that we just had, and as a result of the coalition that exists in uh, Argentina and, uh, at this time, uh, we know that this coalition is starting to think in the future of elections and thinking of who could be an interesting and a viable candidates. So there's that extra polarization, not only in the population, but also within the candidates and the coalition. So I think that would be the main answer to what the result of the pandemic have been. Jason, you said that you have just uh, received the visit of Jose Antonio Cast, who is considered by the press an ultra conservative and extreme right candidate for the Chilean elections and he was in Washington very recently on a road show. So what are the impressions that you uh, got from uh, Jorge Antonio Cash? Hello, Lurival, thank you very much for that question. And hello to Laura, to Jorge, to Juan. It's, it's a pleasure to be sharing this event with you. I have to say that we didn't receive the candidate uh, Mr. Cash here, but he was in Washington as part of a visit to uh, the city in order to share his vision with the uh, stakeholders in Washington. And I think that the time that we are, uh, the, what the, the, the 
transition we're going through in Chile or the moment we're experiencing in Chile right now is showing something that's happening in the entire region where there are two different perspectives. There is a, a decreasing uh, opportunity to have a central uh, position and we can see it in all the countries in Latin America, in the Caribbean region, even in the United States and in the rest of the world. I think there's that polarization in the world that reflects what's happening in this region. At the same time, we have to look at this uh, from the viewpoint of the support to democ democracy. There's a study that has shown that the democracy in this region has decreased in the last few years. It has decreased from 63% to 48% since 2010 to 2018. And last year, it was only 49% the democracy in the region. So I think, uh, sorry, the satisfaction with democracy in the region. So this lack of satisfaction means that we're not responding to the expectations of the population. And it also means that our governments have not uh, transferred benefits to the population, especially during the pandemic. The governments in many cases have not responded in uh, fast enough to the needs and as many of my colleagues have just said there's been a lot of resistance and like skepticism to the policies introduced by the different governments in the initial months of the pandemic and this is something that is uh, continuing up to now that frustration with the governments and the frustration with the lack of vaccines uh, especially in the first few months when uh, those uh, vaccines became available. Rudival, I would like uh, to say that looking into the next year, I'm, I'm worried. I have to say that I'm worried because we have very important elections coming up uh, next year in Colombia, for example, in Brazil as well. And at the same time, in Latin America and um, the Caribbean region has about 8% of the world population, but it has a very little access to vaccines regarding in comparison to the rest of the world. And now we have the Omicron variant, which is has been an important factor of the IMF regarding the growth, the economic growth in the region. And Jorge has just mentioned the, the figures um, for economic growth in Mexico. And I would say they are very similar to those of the entire region. In October, there was an expectation of 3% of economic growth. And this is a very worrying figure. And I'm worried that with this new wave that we're observing in the pandemic, I think that these figures are going to be affected. And this is going to be worsened by the polarization that we're observing, and especially with those elections that we are having next year in two important countries of the region. And especially the idea that there's a lack of democracy, there's a lack of support for democracy in the region and that lack of support to political parties, especially those that have a history in the region and to the entire sector in reality. So what does this mean for the direction that the region is taking in the future? And what does it mean for the region next year? That, would, that is my main worry. Thank you very much. Laura, Jason has mentioned the pandemic and the impact, the socioeconomic impact. Uh, we could say that Chile is an exception. In uh, Chile, there was a very successful vaccination campaign against COVID-19. I think it's been one of the best campaigns in the entire world. Uh, but um, since 2019 in Chile, even before the pandemic, there were other issues, the structural problems, uh, for example, the fact that students, university students had uh, many issues in order to be able to pay university fees, also regarding the private uh, sector, especially private housing, which has meant that many people 
um, have been facing many problems in their country because the system is the, the public system is not very good in order to be able to help those who cannot access private services uh, such as uh, the health services or education services. So could you please talk to us a bit about the social pressure that we are observing in Chile and how that is reflecting on the creation of a new constitution in the country? Thank you very much. I would like to just explain that I've just uh, changed rooms. Uh, I come to, I just moved to my daughter's room. So don't think that this is my usual um, decoration in my in my house. But I would like to say that that question is very interesting. It is true that even though we had a very good response uh, to the vaccination uh, situation in the country, it was a response that was a bit neoliberal saying that whoever needs to die must die. I think the the situation was very much so, especially when people uh, were unemployed, especially women. In Chile, in 10 years, the participation of women in the labor market has discre decreased much. It, Chile has a very low participation of women in the labor market in the Latin American region. But this has decreased even more in a country where women make up about 50% of uh, those in charge of uh, caregiving, and especially in a country where we have seen important consequences, not only of the pandemic, but especially the lack of reaction of a government who is a uh, neoliberal government. What the social uh, demonstrations and movements has shown is that private health system, that pensions are private, that housing is private, everything has been privatized. And this has um, led to a long design of public policies and investing in uh, social services in order to respond to that problem that we've seen in housing, in the health system, in order to cover basic needs and also regarding, as I say, uh, pensions. I, for example, signed a reform of the pension system with the president, Michel Bachelet, where we tried to help women who didn't have any sort of pension. So. Those were a part of the problem, but there were also other issues which affect all democracies in the region, in fact, and which are related to, uh, to corruption, to uh, political party dynamics, which are not appropriate. It's also due to the lack of the presence of the youth and the lack of the presence of women. Uh, political parties in general are led uh, by men, and this ended up with the uh, population getting fed up because in general what they do is just reproduce uh, the image of a heterosexual man who studied in a specific university and who has a discourse that the other that they themselves want to hear. So this is not helping democracy because it does not represent the diversity that exists in the Latin American region and especially, and more specifically in Chile. So that's why the student movements and the different demonstrations le that led to the social explosion in Chile is something that we hadn't experienced in the past. We'd never lived in such an unsta unstable si situation except for during the dictatorship. And finally, it was possible to reach an agreement where the current um, electoral candidate, presidential candidate, Gabriel Boric, was able to um, uh, present a constitutional uh, process what is going to happen with that? 
I would say that some sectors have tried to obstruct that process. And what I would like to see is how we can uh, overcome the binomials that exist, whether in Chile we need to get rid of the Senate or not, whether we should change the presidential system to a parliamentary system. I think it has been shown already that this is not what democracies need when the population is requesting gradual changes and a reforming attitude. I hope that this convention is able to include in a more clear way the things that Chile is promising to defend regarding diversity, inclusion, protection of natural resources, but also being able to integrate all sectors, the entrepreneurs, economic uh, sectors uh, and providing a more social equality in order to ensure that this country is not an exhibition of inequalities in a way in the way that it is right now so i really hope that we can attain those changes in order to be able to materialize once and for all a struggle that is ongoing in Latin America, which is the focus on the policies on women, which are 52% of the populations in most countries. Thank you very much. We understand how the youth are very unhappy, but I would say that the youth are the ones that provide us a better internet connection, as we can see from Laura, who's sitting in her daughter's bedroom. Jorge, turning to you, López Obrador has talked a lot about the small farmers who were excluded from prosperity brought by by the NAFT agreement between the United States and Canada, and which was more beneficial for the North. I would like for you to explain in general how this has not been able to reduce poverty, but how has this benefited uh, the agricultural South? Well, that's still to be seen. Two of the major infrastructure projects, which are the Maya train and the Transismic Corridor, are located at the south southeast of the country. However, they are not built. They are only starting with those projects and they have generated certain temporary jobs for construction works. And we don't know how much investment and how many jobs or the salaries uh, that will be uh, attained. Some people think that they are just white elephants, that they will not work, that uh, these are trains that will go nowhere, from nowhere. However, we're still waiting to see what happens. And the same goes to a very important project from López Obrador as part of these major social projects and programs that I mentioned, which is called Sembrando Vida, So in Life. This is about planting trees in the south and southeast parts of the country by paying each peasant for doing the job. And they will receive a monthly stipend for about a year or maybe two years, depending. And uh, then again, we don't know that uh, what's going to happen. We know that the money is getting to them, at least partially. However, we don't know whether those trees will grow. And we don't know whether the activities, uh, the logging in the trees, in the forest, uh, because you need to erase what there was in order to plant that tree. So we don't know to what extent that might contribute to a greater degree of uh, deforestation. We will need to see that in future. What we do know is that the large amount of public spending uh, with the exception of the Maya train and the Transismic Corridor and of the private Mexican and North American investing, which theoretically was going to be destined at the south and southeast, partly to fight uh, illegal migration, to create a kind of a wall against uh, immigration from Central America, this is no longer going to happen. 
So there was no one cent of public or private investment from the US in the south and southeast parts of the Mexico, um, which are the states that you know, Oaxaca, Chiapas, Campeche, Tabasco, and Yucatan. Not one cent went there, and the private Mexican investment also fell short across the country, and particularly in this region, there was none of that. So that idea, which was correct, the idea that Mr. López Obrador had about a kind of a Marshall plan for the south and southeast parts of the country, which is lagging behind indeed, and which is, which is higher, which has a higher population than the north, not so much than in the, in the center, but uh, it is uh, more densely populated than the north. This, again, never happened. It never happened before, and it will not happen because the investment should have taken place already. This is not something that it's going to come now. And this generates, then again, a problem in this vision of change. The idea was for a big change. The idea was to close the gap between the north and the south. The idea was to reduce poverty in Chiapas and Oaxaca, particularly in those uh, two states which are particularly poor and very, very densely populated. This uh, did not happen. And we are now to see whether the programs and the projects that are ongoing will have any effect or whether they will be as in many cases in Mexico, in Brazil, I remember the large projects from Lula and from many years before, from the 1960s in the northeast of the country. This is very similar to what we are seeing in uh, the south and southeast of Mexico uh, from Senso Furtado back in Brazil. But this is the current picture, this is the current situation and the actual uh, balance that we can make of the six years uh, mandate of Mr. Obrador. Yes, the southeast in Mexico is equals the northeast in Brazil. Uh, there were some plans and programs uh, to create resources and jobs for that area. Uh, Juan, I'm not sure whether you could uh, remove your earpieces, we might get a better quality from you. Jason has referred to the difficulty. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Jason referred to the difficulty of building a political center. This is uh, something that's very visible across all countries. Can I just Sorry, because when I removed my earpieces, I lost a half of the question. Yes, I was saying that Jason commented on the difficulty of making a political centre uh, and how the poles have, re have been reinforced and the centre has lost uh, some of its space. Argentina, something which is very clear across history with uh, President Perón and the attempts for an alternative on the other hand, there is a particularity. I see that Argentinian presidents are able to negotiate with governors because the regional governments have less autonomy than, for, in for instance, the states in Brazil. This is a federation and states are stronger from the uh, political point of view. And I would like you to comment on this. What's that dynamics in Argentina like right now? We seem to be seeing certain polarization in the government between Kirchner and President Alberto Fernandez, which weakens that poll. But uh, is there a dynamic that can lead uh, people to have a stronger center in Argentina? Well, not really. No, there, is, there isn't such dynamics to make a stronger center quite the opposite. Each part are staying in their own positions and they're trying to make the most of the political basis on that uh, position. The autonomy in Argentina is given by the population distribution. If you think that in Argentina 20% of the population is in, in a location of around 400 kilometers, 
and we can understand uh, the reason behind that dynamics and the weight of certain areas of Argentina in uh, Argentinian politics. This is the first uh, thing to, to, to take into account. Secondly, in an area where provinces have won some autonomy is where they manage to get some uh, more power and more attention. For, in, for instance, the north of Argentina with the sun power, wind power, etc. They started signing direct agreements between different pro provinces and with countries like China, Japan, etc. And this is another interesting kind of dynamics that we can see and that we uh, that uh, stands testimony of the regime, the feudal regime in the country. There is a process which is common between Chile and Argentina, and that's the growing violence that we see in the south uh, on the part of uh, insurgencies. And this generates in Argentina a problem that brings us closer to Brazil, and that's uh, the power of uh, drug trafficking. So we are witnessing the same phenomena, but the responses have been very different from the point of view of the relationship of Argentina with uh, Brazil and with Chile. So we hope that in time, after the elections, maybe we can accommodate a little bit more in our positions. And the other problem in Argentina is that there is no tax discipline. If you think at the uh, onset of the Fernandez administration, we saw that dynamic. He said, my main partner today is President López Obrador. However, López Obrador uh, followed a different uh, fiscal policy, very different from the one that uh, the Argentinian president uh, followed. We have our own problems. And uh, these are very problematic for our future because the savings of the Republic of Argentina are being depleted. Uh, the, uh, the statewide authority attacked its own population by depleting and uh, destroying their savings. And that is the, the issue, that is the problem we have seen. So what the future lies for us, it might be common in some aspects. We are starting to see in the mirror of Venezuela, and that's why we see the migrations of Argentinians towards Europe, towards the US in particular. Jason, and speaking of the pandemic, it is often said that the pandemic has shown the importance of the state when it comes to controlling and containing the population. And this is something that we can see in the results of the elections in the US. However, we see that here in Latin America, the state, although they may have spent a great amount of money, and despite the fact that there was already a certain ideology, a certain belief for a strong state as the provider, uh, the guarantee uh, for solutions. Do you think that here the question of the role of the state, the perception of the role of the state may have an influence, uh, a positive influence on the left after the pandemic? How do you see that debate and uh, also the influence of what happened in uh, the United States, the fact that Donald Trump was not able to have a second term? How do you see that dynamics? in the region. Thank you for the question. I think that there is a, a crisis of the state before the pandemic. We saw this uh, with the protests in Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, Guatemala, and other countries in the region. There was some frustration before the pandemic with regard to the benefits of the state and also the results of the state we talk about uh, the growth or otherwise of the GDP, but the big question is not so much the growth of the GDP, but whether that GDP is reaching the people, whether other it is improving the lives of people. And in, in a region where the lack of opportunities is so big, Latin America and the Caribbean region have the highest percentage of uh, the difference in terms of the difference between people with access and people without access. So the lack of equity and equality is so, so wide. 
And this is something that we have seen even more during the COVID pandemic because people with resources may continue to work from their, from their own home. They can start traveling the moment that they have been vaccinated. They can go to Miami to get vaccinated when there was no opportunity to do so in their countries. Whereas those who depend on going to their jobs, uh, who did not have access to uh, the vaccine, uh, this pandemic has shown that division in a very clear fashion. And it has shown that governments did not have the ability to provide benefits and welfare to their people. And uh, this shows the frustration that we have witnessed across the region and uh, not only in the region, but also this is a phenomenon that we have seen all over the world. As uh, Lourival just mentioned, even in the US, where there is frustration with regard to how the government responded to the pandemic. I think that the role of the mayors and of the governors is really important because not only the pandemic, but also the future of the region in each country cannot depend solely on the public policies of the federal governments, but rather in many cases in your country, in Brazil, we have seen a lot of leadership by governors. Jorge, in Mexico, we had recently the governor of Oaxaca talking about the the programs that they are doing, the roads that they are building in order to change the dynamics in the state. So I think that there could be a phenomenon for the future. This could be a trend, not the role, not the role only of the federal governments, but also the sub-regional governments and even more so the cities, the councils, because at the end of the day, the mayors are responsible for the daily life of the populations and the citizens. And they can see even closer the frustrations and the consequences of those frustrations in the local level. I also think that it is very important when we're looking ahead to next year to take into account the uh, Summit of the Americas because the Summit of the Americas is a meeting of all leaders from Latin America and the Caribbean which happens every three or four years. Next year, obviously, the US will host this process. And this will happen at a time where there is a, a lot of polarization in the region. And it will be difficult to reach agreements to come up with a plan of action, which is shared by all leaders. However, what we have seen in recent years, especially in these last two years, is the need to work as a region whenever we can, because the crisis that we are facing uh, in the world and in the region are not uh, uh, crises uh, with boundaries. So it is important to see how we can cooperate and work together. And I also think that we are at a time where we should rethink about what the role of the inter-American system could be for the future, because this system is not uh, working very well. So for the well-being of the region, it will be really important to see how we can change the dynamics today so that we can get to a better consensus for the interest of the region. Uh, uh, where there are many different perspectives, uh, many different ideologies, but really uh, how we can find those common points, uh, that common ground for the future of the region. Yes, I covered the election in Argentina in 2017 when they, uh, the issue of the Mapuches was all the rage because there was a man who died in a situation of conflict because of uh, land. He was not a Mapuche, he was an activist, but this was one of the major issues at the time. And I covered the presidential elections in Chile in 2018, and I don't remember that that may have been an important issue. However, today it is an issue. I'm referring to the protests of the Mapuches in the south, those uh, 
uh, indigenous populations, the Mapuches. And maybe we can hear a little bit more about that, the tensions. I'm not sure whether the right word would be ethnic or racial tensions, but tensions anyway, uh, between the different groups of uh, Chilean society. Yes, I would say that ethnic tensions, all the uh, originating people, particularly the Mapuches, uh, have had conflicts due to the lack of understanding of the rest of the population of uh, who also descend from uh, original, uh, from the Aborigine population. There was scarce understanding uh, also by the democratic governments, which started to implement policies which were mainly centered around recognizing uh, buy-in and uh, provision of lands for these Aboriginal people, uh, which not necessarily came together with other policies such as joining the convention of the uh, International Labour Organization, Convention 179, uh, highlighting the diversity and the multicultural nature of our country, highlighting the different language uh, languages and particularly the language of the Mapuches. And there was, however, a generation that processed all this, and this was the children of the Aboriginal population uh, who have been part of this resistance and this recovery or this struggle for the uh, territorial recovery. And I would like to add that the Mapuche area was uh, given, uh, and today it is uh, the property of uh, wood making uh, companies that uh, depleted the native forests in those lands. So there is also an economic conflict there. Uh, which involves not only Aboriginal populations, but also the interests of the companies themselves, which through different decrees and uh, standards have been benefiting uh, with uh, tax exceptions uh, all over the time. So uh, there is a mixture of uh, issues that have not allowed us to work on uh, some serious policies in this area, and I would like to remind everyone that the indigenous Mapuche population in Chile is concentrated around the metropolitan region, i.e. Santiago. However, the conflict, whether uh, of the Aboriginal population or associations, but also armed groups which are against these organizations have generated what uh, Juan just uh, talked about, uh, and that's the tensions that are generated in the south of the country and which, in the view of the government, can only be resolved with uh, a coup d'etat and demilitarization of the areas without working on other different policies. These policies will require dialogue and the possibility to implement policies uh, which go beyond and which are in the long term and which allow a transition towards processes to allow us to recover uh, peace in this micro area. I think that the role that Elisa Loncon can uh, carry out in that region, in the Mapuche region, uh, is very important. Uh, I might be a bit superficial right now, but she was recently named as one of the most influential women uh, in the world. And uh, even though we shouldn't be too dependent on those uh, rankings, I think that she's a very, uh, she's really prepared. Uh, she has been able to transfer a very important um, mission that she has and let's remember that this is a very important space and I want to be a, optimistic indeed I am optimistic about what is going to happen and we need to be able to rebuild our history 
and to do it without handing the trophy only to a specific group of people. And this has to be a gradual process through which we need to recognize the diversity, as I said before, the diversity that exists in our country through the different tools that we have and which democratic processes provide us with. And uh, we should learn from the experience of war, the use of weapons. And what we cannot allow is for that mechanism of that tool of, of war to be used by the state or by individuals. Thank you very much. You've mentioned, uh, Jason mentioned the federal system in Brazil, in the United States, for example, we know that these are federal systems where the states are more independent than we can see in different other countries in the region. I would like to add another aspect, which is uh, a parliamentarism compared to presidentialism. Here we have a very different way of governing, uh, governing and would, in, in Brazil, for example, is a presidential system, but the seven, 1978 constitution gave much power to Congress, so that equation doesn't really resolve the issue. Do you think you, Jason, that are in the United States, or Jorge, um, Jorge, you are Mexican and you are working in the United States and uh, know what's happening in, in Brazil and you, you really know the entire region. Do you think there is something that could be done uh, to the political system uh, or don't you think that is relevant in this case? Jorge, your microphone is off. If you can please open your mic. I think it is indeed very relevant, as opposed to Laura, perhaps because I'm not very aware of the Chilean situation, I don't know all the details in that country, I don't think that the debate regarding the presidential, uh, yes, the parliamentary system, or the type of federalism that we have in some countries in Latin America compared to a more centralized system is, uh, I think, is a very relevant debate for many reasons. It is relevant, first of all, because, in fact, indeed, there is uh, an issue with a Congress. It's an issue that we have in the United States, of course. I think uh, we can see it in uh, Biden's agenda who was uh, given a certain mandate uh, in the elections and has different proposals most surveys in the united states show that but we've seen how uh, there's a bottleneck uh, at the congress which doesn't enable him to progress we've seen the same situation in chile and we've also seen it in brazil this is not happening currently in mexico but we did observe this in the past in 1997 when prim lost the majority and in, until 2018 when lopez obrador uh, obtained a majority again so i think that there is an issue with the political system, and I think it is a very important debate that is happening in all of the Latin America region. And there's also the tax system. For example, Jason mentioned the road in Oaxaca, a road that's been in, under construction since I can remember, which uh, joins um, the region with the Pacific. I remember driving through that road uh, for the first time in 1973. So as you can see, it's been under construction for a while now. And uh, I think it's going to be an excellent uh, road because uh, Oaxaca is a magnificent region. But um, the issue is that the entire budget of the Oaxaca state is a federal budget, comes from the federal system. The different states in Mexico do not gather any money. All the money comes from the capital. And this is, of course, a big problem if we also have a federal system regarding uh, security, for example. In other words, in Mexico, everyone complains that the municipal and state police are not well prepared, they're not well equipped, well equipped. 
they're not trained and uh, I think that that's a very legitimate complaint but the problem is that the municipalities and the states are not um, gathering any money so it is very difficult for them to obtain money from the capital in order to equip their police corps and that's even worse in the northern region of the country because uh, the government, the federal government has to pay, for example, the police in Monterrey. That would be an aberration because we are transferring money from the entire country, including the poorer regions, to the richest city in the country, which doesn't want to pay its own police because they don't have uh, municipal taxes or state tax. So this debate in Mexico and in the rest of the Latin American region is very relevant. Uh, it's a debate that has been absent for a long time. And I think it is now the time to have this debate and this conversation. I'm not sure whether it is uh, the best place to have this conversation in Chile, but I think it is a very, very relevant debate nowadays. Juan, I don't know uh, if you're jealous of Mexico or uh, of, of, uh, the, that road that is constantly under construction. And if you want, you're invited to come here to Brazil where we start many construction works and we never end them. We've uh, listened to you talk about uh, the multilateral uh, relationships in the subcontinent. And I would like to ask you whether you think that Mercosur and other regional agreements could in some way offer more regarding those issues that we're talking about, like the free trade, if it could perhaps uh, lead to more prosperity and help with uh, different production sectors in the region in Argentina and Brazil, for example. Thank you. I think uh, that we all need infrastructure. Uh, those infrastructure lead to development, but those are the source of corruption in all of Latin America. I think we just lost Juan. Oh, he's back. Okay. Yes. Excuse me, I was saying that what we all have in common is that we need infrastructure, but infrastructure would lead to development because they're good programs, but they're also a source of corruption and problems for Latin America. This obviously has happened in Argentina as well. We have lots of constructions that start but never end. The idea behind Mercosur, uh, what I can say regarding Mercosur is that in Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay and Paraguay, had a common idea in the 1990s when Mercosur was created as a liberal uh, institution, now trying to uh, transfer it and uh, transform it into a more populist uh, idea it was catastrophic for Mercosur. What is the problem that Mercosur is facing nowadays? Well, it is that we are not open to ourselves and we can, are not resilient enough in order to be able to adapt to changes and uh, we are now uh, facing a much more closed world, a more divided world and all those global issues are also seen in Mercosur, for example in Argentina and I don't want to be Argentino-centric, uh, nowadays we consider Mercosur uh, uh, saying that it, uh, questioning whether it affects agreements with China, for example, and China is very closed up to the world, not only from the import point of view, but also from exports, for example, we have to pay extra taxes, making us less competitive. So what we need to do is to try and find uh, this, uh, the situation that led in the 1990s to the creation of Mercosur and which helped societies to be more prosperous. Now we have less prosperous societies, more polarization, less heterogeneous, sorry, more heterogeneous. And so that's why it's more difficult to be able to bridge, uh, to close those gaps. 
After Mercosur, there was another important bridge, which was the agreement with China. When we started to work um, on building those bridges, uh, everything improved. In the current situation, where Latin American countries on saying that they're brothers, we, I think we need to say that we are partners because brothers and sisters can fight. But if we are partners, then I think it's more positive because we have a common aim, a common business. We are regional partners with Chile, and it's very sad to see how sometimes both countries, the uh, take different routes. So sometimes we've been partners with Brazil as well. You've seen in bilateral agreements. And we also need to um, have a Mexico that looks south a bit more and doesn't constantly look north. A country that understands uh, the interests that Mexico has for the rest of the region, whether it's uh, politically speaking or economically speaking. Indeed, in Mexico have a very rich cultural heritage, which is related to its uh, indigenous and uh, colonial past. And uh, here in Brazil, uh, we've seen how Bolsonaro is uh, uh, playing around, and it's better that the, it's Bolsonaro is uh, a partner with other countries instead of brothers. Now I'd like to ask Jason about Venezuela. Venezuela, I think, is a test somehow, or a, it's a frustration regarding the multilateral situation in the region with Canada, with the United States, etc. All those countries have tried to find a solution for the situation in Venezuela. What do you think about the current situation there? Thank you, Lurival, for that uh, question. I think the situation is very worrying. I think that Venezuela is showing the limitations uh, 60 countries recognize the interim government, and I think uh, it is showing the limitations of that model. It would be very important to try and find a different route for Venezuela other than the politics that we've seen in the last few years because they haven't really reached uh, the main goal. It hasn't, the, the current system has not led to the democratization of the system. A couple of weeks ago, we saw in the regional elections how the European Union sent uh, a delegation of observers, and that was a controversial decision. And a few days ago, Maduro said that this delegation had left the country a week before the end of the election period, and they were criticizing the observers, of course, because they had found many irregularities in the electoral process. And in one of the states, uh, the state uh, of birth of Maduro, a candidate of the opposition, is uh, winning in the counting of votes. And uh, now he's saying, Maduro is saying that they have to restart uh, the counting of votes. So I think this is a country where there is a lack of freedoms, a country where there is where someone decides to criticize the government is imprisoned uh, or receives a police visit to their home. And it is a country where the mortality rate and the poverty rate has increased enormously with over 90% of the population living under the poverty line and in a place it's a country where many diseases which were eradicated in the last few decades are now back 
in the country. And this has not only consequences for Venezuela, but also for the entire region, because these are diseases which uh, obviously don't respect any borders. And uh, I must mention the important decision made by Colombia. Colombia has received over 2 million Venezuelan immigrants. And Colombia has given these immigrants a temporary status. And I think this is an important decision for the region and an important message for the future. In Venezuela, there's a question that we can ask uh, in January. What is going to happen with this interim government? What is the international community's position going to be, especially that of the European Union and other independent countries regarding uh, the acceptance of uh, the future form of this interim government. But what I think is also important is that we have recognized that there is a democracy crisis with a lack of freedoms, but there is also a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. As an international community, we need to see how we can uh, not support the Maduro uh, dictatorship, but also support the population, support uh, people who are suffering as a result of the humanitarian crisis. It's a very complex situation indeed. And Lourvial, the situation in Nicaragua is also very worrying uh, in the last elections we have seen how the mandate has been renewed even though there has been no respect for the voters and uh, in a situation where the candidates of the opposition did not have the opportunity to compete in those elections so uh, i think these signs are very worrying for the entire region and uh, show how important it is for the region to work together for the future. Yes, in the last elections in Venezuela, had a very low participation rate of around 42%, and those remaining 58% of uh, electors who did not go to vote are not very happy, and they are very strong because you can see the distribution of the people who did not vote. They are important for the society. And it, they are important to for the regime to have a good perception. So not going to vote takes courage in the country. And in Nicaragua, more than 30 people were jailed months before the last election, including the eight competitors, the eight other candidates in the opposition, including Cristiana Chamorro, the daughter of Violeta Chamorro, who defeated uh, uh, the, her, her opponent uh, back in the 1990s. So everything is very symbolic in Nicaragua. I would spend many hours more talking to you, but if I do that, uh, you will never uh, be joining any further meetings. So I do not want to abuse your generosity. So, uh, Laura, you have been very representative in our talk. You are the only woman. So I want to thank you for being here with, with us, for bringing the issue of representation and the role of women, which is so important across the world. Thank you very much for being part of this talk. I hope it will be the first of very many to come. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Jorge, thank you for bringing your experience, your knowledge, because you have a vast experience and uh, you were making your luggage.